I'd like to welcome all that are joining with us for our service this morning, that are listening in online, and we bid you welcome in our Saviour's precious name. And if you don't normally listen in to Cache Free Presbyterian Church, well then we do bid you welcome today, and trust that you'll enjoy fellowship with us as we meet around God's precious word. We're turning first of all to the book of Lamentations, and we have been reading through it Sunday by Sunday, and we're coming to the chapter 4 this morning, and we're going to commence with the verse 1 of the chapter. Book of Lamentations, the chapter 4, and the verse 1. How is the gold become dim? How is the most fine gold changed? Stones of the sanctuary are poured out on the top of every street. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, how are they esteemed as earth and pitchers, the work of the hands of the potter? Even the sea monsters draw out the breast, they give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people has become cruel, like the ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the sucking child cleaveth to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The young children ask bread, and no man breaketh it unto them. They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embraced dung hunts. For the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom. That was overthrown as in a moment, and no hand stayed her. Amen, and we know that the Lord will bless his own precious word to our hearts. This morning, as the prophet Jeremiah penned these words, he was thinking of the nation of Israel, and he was thinking of the hard times that they were going to go through in captivity. And this is how he speaks here of starvation. Such was the plight of the children, the people, and no one seemed to care. And how sad it is when God's people turn away from God, and he has to chasten them and to punish them to bring them back to himself. We're going to worship together in the singing of a hymn this morning. It's a well-known hymn, the hymn number 40. We'll worship the King, all glorious above. We'll gratefully sing his power and his love. And as you sit in your own home, you can sing together as a family, or as the words come up on the screen, or you can sing all out in your own. Don't you worry, just sing out unto the Lord. Hymn number 40, and let's sing unto the Lord, please.
us just seek the Lord in a word of prayer. Our loving God and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the opportunity to seek thy face in prayer. We thank you, Lord, that we come unto thee, in and through the name of our blessed Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, we praise thee today for that one whom we can call our Redeemer, that one the blessed Son of God, that one who bled and died in the cross of Calvary, that old sinners and rebels such as we might be saved and numbered amongst the saints of God. Our Father, we praise thee today for that access by the shed blood. And as we come into thy most holy presence, we do give you thanks for every blessing that thou hast bestowed upon us. Our Father in heaven, we praise thee, Lord, that in these days of pandemic, Lord, that we know that measure of health and strength. We thank you, Lord, for thy grace and thy tenderness, thy mercy upon us even at this time. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to meet together to preach thy word, Lord, even over the medium of the internet. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that it is the entrance of thy word that giveth light. We thank you, Lord, that it is thy word that reveals unto us the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is thy word that reveals unto us that way of salvation that is to be found by faith alone and Christ alone. Dear Father, we realize it is thy word that reveals unto us the law of the living God. Dear Father in heaven, as we come to thee this morning, we recognize that we are those that are to abide by thy rules and by thy commands. We recognize that while the law, it reveals our weakness, it reveals our inability to keep the law, it reveals unto us our sin. Yet we thank you today that there is a Saviour, that there is that one, the only Redeemer of God's elect, that one who gave us life a ransom for the many, there on the cross of Calvary. Our Father God, we do pray this morning, Lord, that thou would be with thy people. Lord, we're mindful of every family connected with this congregation here. We think of the children, we think of the adults. Lord, we ask and pray that thou would undertake for each one, Lord, in their various homes and in their various situations. Our Father, we think of parents, Lord, in these days that are teaching the boys and girls. We pray that thou would be with them. We pray, Lord, for the children that are missing out on their friends, that they would meet at school. Lord, be with them, we do pray. Our Father, we think of those, perhaps, that are furloughed or at home, unable to go into their workplace because of the pandemic. Our Father, we pray that thou would strengthen them and encourage them. Lord, we think of those that have lost jobs and perhaps are hit financially. We pray, Lord, at this time that thou would draw near and meet them at the point of their need. Our Father, we come to thee this day, recognizing that thou art a God that knows all that is going on. Lord, you know every aspect of our land and our nation, all the problems that it faces. And Lord, we thank you we can look to thee and know thy strength and know thy help in such times. Our Father God, this day we do remember those that are laid aside, those that are sick, those that are in a hospital bed. Dear Father God, we pray that in thy grace and mercy, Lord, that thou would touch them, in thy will and purpose, that thou would lift them up to that better measure of health and strength. Our God, we come to one today who is that great physician. Our Father, we read the New Testament scripture and time again we're brought to consider the great miracles wrought by the Lord Jesus Christ. How he touched the sick and made them whole again. He touched the leper and cleansed away that disease from their body. Lord, made them whole. We think of Jairus and his daughter and how she was raised to life again. Dear Father, we praise thee that thou art still the God of miracles today. Lord, we recognize, yes, we have a health service. Lord, thou hast given wisdom to the medics. Lord, that they might have the right medications. And Lord, how to deal with some things. But Lord, we thank you that thou above all things, Lord, are the giver of health and strength and of life and death. Dear Father, we pray for those that need thy touch. Lord, that thou would graciously draw near and strengthen them and encourage them even at this time. Our Father, we do pray for our land. We recognise that it needs the intervention of the God of heaven. Lord, we realise there's much fear, much anxiety. Dear God, we ask and pray that in such a time that thou would touch the hearts and minds of men and women. Lord, that thou would cause them to fear the God of heaven. That thou would cause them to look unto thee. Lord, that they might cry unto thee for mercy. That they might cry unto thee in confession and repentance. And know that salvation that thou alone can give. Our Father, we do remember those that rule over us, those that exercise authority. And we pray, Lord, that thou would give them wisdom at this time. Lord, thou hast told us in thy word, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. Our Father, we pray that they might seek not man's wisdom, but they might seek the wisdom of God. And Lord, that they too would come with that repentant heart. Lord, we recognize that there's laws, there's legislation in our land that is contrary to thy word. Dear Father, we cry unto thee that thou would deal with such matters. Lord, that thou would undertake for those that have the rule over us. 
Lord, that they might do that which is right in the sight of the thrice holy God. Our Father in heaven, continue with us this morning, we do pray. We ask, Lord, that all that is said and done this day might be to thy honour and to thy glory. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we ask all of these things. Amen. We're coming this morning, we normally do a little story for the boys and girls, a little Bible lesson, and we're coming to do the same this morning. Boys and girls, as you look at your screen now, you should see a picture, and perhaps you're looking at it and thinking, that's a strange looking object. Well, we put on a second picture, and when you look at this, it might help to give you an indication of what's going on. You see, the picture that you're looking at is a picture of a lamp. First picture, it shows the lamp just sitting there, as it were. The second picture shows the lamp lit. And it is what is known as a tilly lamp. If you're speaking to your mum, your dad, or your grandparents, they'll tell you that that's a tilly lamp. And you put oil into it, and as it burns the oil, it creates light. Now, you've probably never seen them before. We live in an age where you go to the wall and you flick the switch and the electric comes on. We have electric lighting. But way before electric was discovered and used in a wholesale manner, people used tilly lamps. In the towns, they had gas, they had gas street lights. But out in the rural areas, people would have used a lamp. And they'd have had to fill the lamp up with oil. There's a little wick inside it that burns. They'd have had to trim the wick, make sure it was nice and clean. And then they would have lit it with a match and put the cover over it. And that was their light. And you could adjust it up and down to get a good flame. If you didn't do it right, the light went out. If you moved it too much, then it was very smoky and sooty. And the glass all went black. And that wasn't good either. So it took a little bit of time and a little bit of practice to get it right. But when we think of the light, boys and girls, the Bible has much to teach us and to tell us about light. In fact, when we look at the book of Genesis, when we think of this world in the time of creation, we're told that there in Genesis 1 verse 3, the very first words that God spoke in relation to this world, this world were let there be light, and there was light. Into the darkness of this old world, we're told at the beginning of Genesis that it was void and without form. It was just blackness, darkness, there was nothing. And God spoke, and there was light. And light makes a vast difference to everything that is around us today. Whenever you and I come into a room, it's dark, and when we turn on the light, we can see what is there. And so God spoke, and the world was changed. Light was formed. Light could be seen. We think of the Lord Jesus Christ, and over there in the Gospels, in John chapter 8, in the verse 12, Jesus again said unto them, I am the light of the world, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. There the Lord Jesus Christ says of himself, I am the light of the world. Now that didn't mean that he was a light and that it helped us to see in dark places, but he was speaking spiritually. He was one who came into this world to bring light to those that were in the darkness of sin. So as we think of light, first of all it does something for us. It changes our view. Sometimes maybe in your own home, maybe you've went into the room and you haven't turned on the light and you look and you see something that frightens you. You think there's somebody sitting in the room. And then when you turn on the light, you realise, oh, it's just a coat hanging on a hanger. Or, or maybe it's just the wardrobe doors open a little bit. Or the curtain's sitting funny. And you feel silly after it because it scared you in the dark. But when the light was on, you see what it really was. Maybe it's the same when you go outside. But if you go out for a walk at night and there's no, no stars shining and the moon's not very bright and you see something a wee bit up the lane and you get a wee bit scared about it. What's that? And you don't go too far. You maybe just come back because you're worried about what it is. And then the next day when you're out in daylight, you look, it's a branch of a tree. It was maybe just a bush that was there or maybe a ladder sitting at the side of the house and it scared you a little. But when the light is there, the fear is gone because you can see what is before you. And you know, boys and girls, that's the same uh, with salvation. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes into our heart, when he comes in and saves us and cleanses us from sin, there's a light comes in. Uh, it takes away all the fear. It takes away all the darkness that is there. And it gives us a peace and a joy that's found in him alone. You see, we can be a scared, boys and girls. We can be afraid of people. We can be afraid of circumstances. We can be afraid of making a mess of things. Afraid of doing things wrong. And that can make people very worried and very anxious. But you know, if we have the Lord Jesus Christ in our heart as Saviour, we ought not to be afraid. In 1 John 4 and the verse 18 we're told, There is no fear in love, 
But perfect love casteth out fear. And that's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, boys and girls. The Lord Jesus Christ so loved you and I that he gave us life on the cross of Calvary. When we're unsaved, our hearts are dark. We're far away from God. But when we repent of our sin and by faith look to the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ comes into our heart. He brings in light. He brings in peace. He brings in his love. And that drives away fear. So for the child of God, for the boy and girl that's saved, we ought not to fear because we bring all of those things to the Lord in prayer. And he helps us to face the things that are around about us in life. But you know, whenever the light is there, not only does it give you a new view, but it helps us to walk right. The psalmist over in Psalm 119, in the verse 105, he said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And maybe you're going out at night and you take the torch with you. And if you hadn't the torch there, or you hadn't the light on, well, you could walk onto walls, you could walk onto trees, you could trip and fall and hurt yourself. But whenever you have the light, you can see where you're walking. It lights up the path before you, makes it really clear, and you know where you're going. And boys and girls, the Bible's like that. The psalmist said, this Bible, this book, it's a lamp onto our feet and the light onto our path. Now that doesn't mean if you go out in the dark night with your Bible with you, you can see where you're walking. That's not what it's saying. But it's saying, boys and girls, as you and I read the Bible, it teaches us the things that are right, good to do, and it teaches the things that are wrong. And therefore it affects how we walk. As we read the Bible, we know we shouldn't be telling lies. We shouldn't be stealing. We shouldn't be dishonouring our parents. We should be reading our Bible. We should be praying. We should be helpful. And as we do those things and listen to the word of God, then we're walking in the right way before God. So as we think of the lamp, it brings two lessons to our heart. It reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ who comes in and cleanses us from sin. And that gives you and I a new view in the world. We view everything in a different manner. It helps us to walk aright because the Bible is our light. And we need to read it, read it and pray that the God, the God would speak to us from us and guide us and direct us day by day. But you know, as we think of the light, we're reminded that you and I are to be lights. There's a little chorus that the boys and girls sing. It says, give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. And that's speaking, boys and girls, about you and I living for the Lord. That tully lamp that we showed you at the start, you had to put oil into it. If you put no oil into it and you try to light it, it won't work. And boys and girls, you and I can't live for the Lord unless, first of all, we're saved and the Lord's in our heart. And then we need to pray that the Lord would fill us with his Holy Spirit. The oil speaks of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. And you and I need the help of the Spirit of God to live for him day by day, that we might shine. And we need to pray every day, Lord, help me to live for you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, that I might show forth the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in my heart. So as we think of light, boys and girls, my prayer is that each one of you will know the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour, and that you will live as lights for the Lord Jesus Christ, that you will be a witness for him, and that as other people see you, as they see you burning brightly, not burning dim, but burning nice and bright, and living for the Lord, they'll say, there's somebody different. There's a boy or girl, and they're always happy, they're always smiling, they never seem to worry. I would love to be like that. And you can tell them that, because Jesus is in my heart, and I take all my worries, and all my fears, I bring them all to him. He deals with them. And boys and girls, I trust that each one that's listening in, that you will know salvation, and that you will know that help of God as you live for him day by day. Thank you very much, boys and girls, for listening. We're turning this morning for our scripture reading over to the book of Nehemiah. And we have been studying in the book of Nehemiah for quite some time. And as we come this morning, this is the final chapter. Final chapter of the book. And we're bringing that study to a conclusion today. It's quite a lengthy chapter, but we read it all together. It's Nehemiah chapter 13. And we'll just get the whole thing in context of what is happening here. Nehemiah, the chapter 13, and we're reading from the verse 1. On that day they read in the book of Moses, in the audience of the people, therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. How be it our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass when they'd heard the law, 
that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. And before this, Eliashib, the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. And he had prepared for him a great chamber, where aforetime they laid the meat offering, the frankincense, the vessels and the tithes of corn, the new wine and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites, and the singers and the porters, and the offerings of the priests. But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem, for in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. And I came to Jerusalem, and understood of the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah, in preparing him a chamber in the court of the house of God. And it grieved me sore. Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chamber, and hither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and frankincense. I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to his field. Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is it that the house why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then brought all Judah the tithe of the corn, and the new wine and the oil, unto the treasuries. And I made treasures over the treasuries, Shalemiah the priest, and Zadok the scribe, and of the Levites, Padiah, and next to them was Hanan the son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah, for they were counted faithful, and their office was to distribute unto their brethren. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, Wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, bringing in sheaves and lading asses, as also wine, grapes, figs, and all manners of burden, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victims. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah, and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah, and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do, and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus? And did not our God bring all this evil upon us, and upon this city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. It came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut, and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. Some of my servants said I at the gates, that there should be no burden brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kinds of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. Then I testified against them, and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves, and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. In those days also saw I the Jews that had married wives of Ishtod, of Ammon, and of Moab. Their children spake half in the speech of Ishtod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. I contended with them, and cursed them, smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations... Was there no king like him, who was beloved of his God? And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish woman cause to sin. Shall we hearken unto you to do this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? One of the sons of Josiah, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to St. Balat, the Horonite. Therefore I chased him from me. Remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood, 
and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. Thus cleansed I them from all strangers and appointed the wards of the priests and the Levites, every one in his business. And for the wood offering, at times appointed, and for the first fruits, remember me, O my God, for good. We'll end our reading there at the close of the chapter, and we know that God will bless his own precious truth to each one of our hearts today. Once again, we extend a warm word of welcome uh, to all that are listening in, and we trust and pray that we know the Lord's presence and the Lord's help as we come to consider his word this morning. Uh, please do remember the service this evening at 7 p.m. And again, it will be broadcast online. And we do invite you to join with us and to spend time around God's precious truth. And then we would remind you of the prayer meeting on Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Uh, please tune in then as well. Uh, this Wednesday night, we're going to do something a little different. Our prayer meeting is going to be broadcast in the usual manner on Facebook, on YouTube. But after that, after the time of prayer, at a quarter to nine, we're going to have a Zoom meeting. And we're going to have our prayer over Zoom. We did a little test run on Thursday night, and a number tuned in. And after a wee bit of time, we got everybody talking and communicating with each other. We could hear them, and they could hear us. And it was all very clear. So we're hoping to, to do that on Wednesday night. And I will send out a little text message, uh, probably on Wednesday, earlier on in the day, uh, just reminding you of that Zoom meeting and giving you the details that you can click on the link to log in for that meeting that night. It's not for the whole meeting, it's just for the season of prayer after we broadcast on Facebook and YouTube. So please do remember that on Wednesday night. And then our church, they had a time of prayer over Zoom the other Saturday, and that went very well. Quite a number logged in, there were under over 400 that registered for it, and we had good times of prayer. Uh, they divide you up into little rooms, so all of these rooms, keep, people can be praying on them at the same time. So uh, people enjoyed it and were encouraged by it and sent messages to that end. And so the Presbytery has organised another one, and that's on Saturday the 30th of June. Uh, there will be two seasons of prayer, one in the morning at 10, and then one in the afternoon at 2. And we'll send out details of that, or you'll find them on our Facebook page of Who's Speaking at those as well. So please do remember that on Saturday the 30th of January. Then do remember the services next Lord's Day and again we'll be broadcasting them online and there will be DVDs sent out as well to those that require them. Do also remember the Sunday School, the online Sunday School for the boys and girls on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. by FBC Kids and then our brother Colin Tinsley also does one at half 10 as well. Uh, so we encourage you to tune in. Uh, and during the week Colin does assemblies and if the boys and girls would like to tune in, you can see them on Facebook and on YouTube as well. We would also ask you to pray for the sick in the church. There are some who have been in hospital, some were out and some who are still in. I do remember them at the throne of grace and prayer. I do also remember those that we know that are sick within our congregation. Continue to pray for them, that the Lord will strengthen them. I do remember Orlando this time. I do remember those that work. Uh, within our medical services and providing care and assistance within the community at uh, this time of pandemic. And do pray that God in grace and mercy would intervene. Do remember all of these things. And all of these announcements are subject to the will of God. We're turning again to God's precious word, uh, to the chapter that we read a moment ago, uh, Nehemiah chapter 13. And just with God's word open before us, let's just seek the Lord. Our loving God and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to meet around thy precious word. We ask and pray that thou would give us help, give us liberty, give us direction from thyself. Our Father, I pray that thou would fill me with thy Holy Spirit. Lord, we come to thee in helplessness, we come to thee in weakness. We ask and pray, Lord, that thou would use these words for thy honour and for thy glory. And Lord, that above all things, that thy name would be magnified, thy name would be uplifted. Lord, speak to thy people. Encourage them, strengthen them, we pray. Lord, for any that know thee not, challenge them afresh today. And grace and mercy bring them in to the fold of God. Continue with us. Close us in with yourself. For it's in your blessed name we ask all these things. Amen. As we come to this final chapter of the book of Nehemiah, to you and I it might seem like a long time in getting through these 13 chapters. And maybe you're thinking, it's took a long time. I thought those walls were never going to be built. 
But we come to the final chapter, and it's good for you and I, as we think about the book of Nehemiah, just to remember where it fits in in a chronological sense. So often we come to the Bible, we think Genesis is the beginning, and all of the books come in order after that. But that's not quite right. Because Nehemiah, this book that we've been looking at over these past weeks and months, this is really the last bit we will hear of the history of the nation of Israel before you come to the Gospel of Matthew. Because this book, Nehemiah, fits in after the children, have been, children of Israel have been in captivity, after they have returned to the city of Jerusalem. And we need to remember that. So Nehemiah, when we look at it, it really fits in with the book of Malachi. They are two of the final books that we read relating to the history of the children of Israel before we have that chasm of 300 years where we hear nothing and then we come to Matthew's Gospel. It is significant in that regard that this is the last mention that we will hear of Jerusalem as it were until we find it visited by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also a sad chapter. Because as we read this closing chapter in the book of Nehemiah we find that the children of Israel have drifted away from the things of God. This book that we've looked at, we've went through it chapter by chapter, page by page, and we've followed Nehemiah and the battles that he's had and, and getting the walls established and getting the gates of the city built up and seeking to get the inhabitants into the city and to seek to introduce law and order and worship within it. But as we come to this final chapter of the book, it's sad because we see a decline in the things that are happening. As we come to chapter 13, Again, we draw your attention to the dates that are mentioned within it. Because this chapter 13, while it follows on from chapter 10, 11, and 12, there is a space of time in between them. Whenever you look at Nehemiah chapter 2 and the verse 1, you'll learn there that Nehemiah comes to the city of Jerusalem. He comes in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king. So we come to Jerusalem. He come to rebuild the walls. That was in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. You look at chapter 13. And you look down there at the verse 6. And there we find that Nehemiah is speaking. And he says, But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem. For in the 2 and 30th year of Artaxerxes king of Babylon. Came I unto the king. And after certain days obtained I leave of the king. And I came to Jerusalem. So as you look at these words here. We're mindful. Nehemiah has come to the city. The walls have been built, and as you read the verses, we find that in Nehemiah chapter 6 and the verse 15, it took the 25th day of the month, 52 days it took them to build the walls. And remember, Nehemiah was employed by the king, so he couldn't come and reside in Jerusalem forever. He came for those 52 days, he built the wall. He got government established, he got worship established, and then he went back to his job at Shushan in the palace. He was the king's cupbearer. But it seems as we come to chapter 13 that after a period of around 12 years, he has returned to Jerusalem. He has returned to see how things are progressing. And sadly, as we read these verses, they are not progressing as they ought. In the scientific world, uh, we hear of what is called the second law of thermodynamics. And you're thinking, that's a big term. What does that mean? Well, it simply means when things are left to themselves, they decay. You take your car and you park it outside. And you don't service it, you don't wash it, you don't look after it. And after about 10 or 12 years, well, there'll be a fair wee bit of rust on it if it's still going. If you've never serviced it, it may not even start. And that's what that law indicates. Things left to themselves, they begin to decay. You look at the dwelling house and you leave it for 20 years and you, you don't paint it, you don't wash it, you don't look after it. Well, you'll find that the outside of the wall begins to get green, it begins to look grubby. The doors begin to get stiff. The handles begin to get stiff. It begins to decay. It gets away. And, and it's one of those laws, in fact, that we can use it to speak against evolution. Evolution says everything's improving. If you give it more time, it will get better. But the scientific law, the second law of thermodynamics, indicates that things get worse. Whenever you leave things, they decay. They begin to rot. They begin to decompose. They begin to seize up and stop working. And sadly, as we look at these Jews that have been here in the city of Jerusalem, it seems that after these 12 years, instead of them being closer to the Lord, we find that they have drifted away. And there is that challenge as we come to look at this chapter to you and I as God's people. Because you see, as Christians, living and working and walking with the Lord, that does not just happen by chance. It requires effort. 
It requires time. It requires dedication. And that's what's failed here amongst the Jews. You and I, as we think of this old physical body, if we don't look after it, we get sick. If we don't eat healthy as we should, if we don't do a degree of exercise, well then, the body stops functioning as it ought. The immune system becomes bad. It, it breaks down and we're susceptible to sickness and to disease. And you could say the same spiritually. If Christians do not look after their lives spiritually, if they do not read the Bible, if they do not pray, if they do not have fellowship with God and with God's people, then they begin to get cold of heart. They become susceptible to false doctrines and heresies that are abounding around us in this world today. And therefore there is an emphasis upon you and I as God's people that we walk closely in fellowship with the Lord. Now as we look at this chapter, 12 years have passed from Nehemiah has been in the city of Jerusalem and we're reminded that this drift, this, this backsliding, because that's what it is, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a gradual decline. If you've ever been out in the car and maybe you've come back and you've noticed one of the wheels is a little bit soft and you never bothered to blow it up, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow. One morning you'll go out and the wheel's flat. The air gradually gets away from it and it's flat. And it reminds you and I, if we lose touch with the Lord, over time that fellowship gets worse and worse. And we get further and further away from communion and fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ and get into sin. The quiet time disappears. Then the attendance at the house of God disappears. Then we can progress into sin. And ruin and destroy our testimony. So as we look at the children of Israel here, we feel, we see that there is that decline in their service, in their witness, and in their obedience to the God of heaven. And so this morning, for a few moments, I want you to look with me at this chapter, and we want to consider dealing with the backslidden people. Because that's what Nehemiah has to do here. He comes back to this city and he comes in as it were and he observes. And what he sees grieves his heart and, and weighs upon him and he realises there are wrongs that need to be righted and need to be corrected. And we want this morning just to look at those things and, and how he goes about it. Whenever we think of the children of Israel, we are reminded that they were prone to wander from the Lord. You can read Exodus chapter 20 and there are... Moses brings the Ten Commandments before them. They listen to them all over those next few chapters of chapter 20 through to chapter 22. And then in chapter 24 we read that the people make a covenant before God that they will obey God's laws and God's commands. You move on through the book of Exodus to chapter 34 or 32. There we find that they make the golden calf. They've forgotten that very first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And there we find them. Moses is up the mountain. They say to Aaron, make us a golden calf. They go into idolatry. That vow is renewed in, in chapter 34. And then again when we come to the book of Joshua. We find Joshua before the people go into the land of promise. He renews the vows again. We see in scripture how the law of God had to be brought before them afresh and anew on a regular basis lest they forget it and wander astray. We look at the opening verse of the chapter. It says on that day they read in the book of Moses and the audience and the people. It would seem that this is the first time the book of the law has been read for many years. And as the book is read they realize that they have not been doing things as they ought. And you see, friend, that's why we need to be students of the Bible. For that man or woman who professes themselves to be saved, who professes themselves to be a Christian, they need to be reading the Bible. That's how this people knew that they were doing wrong. They discovered what was written in the law of God, and they realized we've been sinning. We've been grieving the God of heaven. The neglect of the word of God had brought them into sin. And that's the warning that you and I need to take heed of in this chapter. We need to realize that you and I can drift into sin. We need to realize that as God's people, being saved is just not a matter of uh, professing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and it all ends to come. Yes, we're saved for time and for eternity, but to live an effective Christian life, to live a Christian life and know the blessing of God, we need to be in fellowship and communion with God. You know, the children of Israel, when we read of them here in Nehemiah, Back in the chapter 10, they made a covenant. Chapter 10 and the verse 39, you look back, and they said, we will not forsake the house of God. And yet as we read this chapter, they did. 
They neglected the temple. They neglected the reading of God's law. And thus we find them in this sad situation. Whenever Nehemiah comes here. In chapter 13. You, the verse 11. You'll see he's challenging the people. He says why is it that the house of God. Why is the house of God forsaken? They went back on their word. <coughs> they promised. They vowed before God. That they would not forget the law of God. In the house of God. And yet they have done it. They have relapsed into sin. And you know what we read in, in chapter 13. It is right up to date. Because Christian friend. The same happens in this world in which we live today. The same can happen to you or I. It's not a case where we read the Bible. And say well the Jews backslid. They got away from the Lord. They got cold of heart. That would never happen to me. That can. As you and I read the Bible. We see it happened to others. We look at the life of Abraham. Abraham sinned. He denied his wife. She, he claimed she was his sister. He told lies. We look at David. David committed sin with Bathsheba. We look at King Solomon, who is mentioned in this chapter. A man who God granted wisdom to, to, to run his kingdom, and yet we find in his own personal life that wisdom was lacking. He had a multitude of wives, and they laid his heart away into idolatry after other gods. So it does happen, it can happen, and it will happen if we are not careful. General Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, he once wrote a letter to his staff and he put it this way. He said, I want you always to bear in mind that it is the nature of a fire to go out. You must keep it stirred and fed, and the ashes continually removed for the fire to keep burning. And you and I know that. You light a fire in your house and you leave it after a time it goes out. If you don't put sticks on it, it will go out. And for you and I as God's people, if that flame of love is to be burning in our hearts, we need to be fueling it. We need to be feeding it on a daily, on a regular basis. We need to be feeding it with the word of God. We need to be feeding it with the oil of the Holy Spirit as we pray and plead with the God of heaven. For the children of Israel as we look at them here. You go back to chapter 10. I encourage you to read it again in your own time. And you'll notice the promises that they made there. There were four particular promises. Number one they promised to submit to God's law. Secondly they promised to live separate from the world. Thirdly they promised to keep the Sabbath day. And fourthly they promised to support the work of God. In a practical and in a financial way. And sadly as we come to chapter 13. All of those things have been broken. We think of the law of submission. In chapter 10 verse 29 it says. The people bound themselves with an oath. To follow the law of God. We've already mentioned verse 1. Here the people as they read the book of Moses. That's the law of God. They indicate they haven't been obeying it. They realize that within their multitude. Is now found the Ammonite and the Moabite. They should not be there in the congregation of God. They've neglected God's law. The Bible has been set aside. It has not been opened. And now when they do open it, they realize they've been breaking God's commands. The house of God has been forsaken. Yes, in chapter 10, there was joy, there was happiness, there was rejoicing when this covenant was made. Oh, the people's hearts were thrilled. The walls of the city were built. They were now back in Jerusalem again. The temple had been opened. Worship had been established. Their hearts were full and overflowing with joy. But over time, that joy is weaned. Over time that obedience has, has disappeared. Over time they've drifted away from the Lord and, and other things have come in. You see the indication is that in the lives of these Jews. Other things had taken priority. Doesn't tell us what their business was. Perhaps they were establishing new houses. Perhaps they were establishing new businesses. Perhaps they were concerned with their family but. Whatever took priority, it certainly was the law, was not the law of God. But you and I as God's people need to remember the same can happen to you and I. Maybe you're listening in this morning and you can look back to a day and hour when you were saved. You can look back to that night or that day when you sat in the meeting. My, there was a joy that filled your heart. Your life was overflowing and you went out and you were on cloud nine as it were. You wanted to tell everybody about the Lord Jesus Christ and, and what he meant to you and the change that he'd made in your life. And you love to read the Bible. You'd open the scriptures and you'd read chapter after chapter after chapter. You love to pray. 
Your heart was thrilled when you were got the time in the morning before work or school or whatever to, to pray and to seek God. Ever in prayer, ever in the word of God, you love to go to church. I, you loved, whenever you heard the preacher, you had the pen out and you were marking down in the Bible the different verses and the, the different things that were highlighted. You loved to do that. But you don't anymore. Friend, what has changed? The Bible hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. What's made the difference? Is it a possibility that you have changed? Is it a possibility that the, the love for the Bible is not the same as it once was? Is it the case that that joy in your heart is not the same as it once was? What's changed? Just the same as we look at the Jews here. Things have changed. Today maybe it's the case where the quiet time is fitted in when you get an opportunity. You get out of bed and do the work, whatever has to be done. And Well, if you get time to read your Bible, that's all right. But if you don't, we'll get it fitted in sometime. And, and maybe you're going to bed at night and it's never been fitted in. Life has become so busy. Maybe you've become the, the thing that, well, I'm not too bad. I have plenty of work on. I'm, I'm well up financially. I don't really need God. And then when something goes wrong, everybody's looking prayer and everybody's turning to the word of God. We need God now. Christian friend, we need to be careful. We need to be careful that we keep short accounts with our God. That we are not those that grow cold, even as these Jews have here in the city of Jerusalem. The New Testament church suffered the same problem. Over there in the book of Revelation, we have the letters to the seven churches. And as the angel is writing that letter to the church in Ephesus, there in Revelation chapter 2, we read these words in the verse 4. It says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Christian friend cannot be said of you. And as I read these words this morning, and as I read through this chapter, it challenges my heart. Have I left my first love? Have you as a congregation, you as the saints of God, have you grown cold with the Lord? Has that fire got down? Is the ember glowing very dimly? Is it just about it? In your life for the Lord Jesus Christ. That angel to the church at Ephesus. They'd left their first love. That was the case here with these people. These inhabitants in the city of Jerusalem. That was the worry of this man, Nehemiah. As we read the chapter we find here that there is a man called Tobiah the Ammonite. He's an idolater. He's a vile and a wretched and a wicked man. And yet we find him here. He's in the house of God. He has a room, a chamber prepared for him in the very temple. This is a man. This ought not to be happening. This man who is an enemy of Nehemiah. This man who is an enemy of the Jews. This man who hated and despised the Jews, he's here living in the temple. The house of God, instead of being worshipped, it's become a residence for this man. If you look at verse 5, we find there that they put out the frankincense and the, the corn and all the things that ought to have been there. They cast them out and they put this man in. And maybe there's things in your life that have changed. Maybe where the Lord used to be, the Lord has been pushed out and a whole lot of other things have filled it in we need to examine our own hearts. What occupies our time? What occupies our thoughts? What occupies our plans and our ambitions? Is it the things of God? Here's a people. They were not submitting to the Lord. We notice also even as we think of this man Tobiah. That they had neglected in separation. The verse tells us. The verse 1. That the Ammonite and the Moabite. Should not come into the congregation of God forever. And as we read verses 4 and 9, we see that Nehemiah was horrified to find that this man, Tobiah, had a guest room in the temple. He couldn't get over the fact of it that they allowed such a vile, wicked man to be in it. Whenever we read back to chapter 2 and the verse 10, you will notice there it says, When Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. This man, Tobiah, he was one of the major enemies against Nehemiah. 
He hated the, to hear the news that Nehemiah was there. In fact, as you read about him, and we have noted him throughout this book, he told lies about Nehemiah, he mocked the work of the builders, he plotted to kill Nehemiah, he hired false prophets to speak against him, and yet we find this man, where is he? He's living in a chamber in the temple. He's in the house of God. And as we've said already, they put the good things out, the vessels out, to bring this man in. Isn't it sad when you read these verses how far they had departed away from God? How far they'd got away from the laws and commands of God? You see, once the law of God, the book of God is set to one side, once the Bible is set to one side, everything else follows in. That was the first thing. Once they'd stopped submitting to God, once they began rebelling against God, because, dear friend, that's the truth of the matter. If you and I are not living in submission to God, in obedience to God, then we're fighting against God. That's true of us. Oh yes, we may be saved by God's grace. But if we're not submitting unto God's laws and God's commands and living by them, then we're living in rebellion against God. And that's what Israel were doing here. They weren't exercising the separation that was commanded in God's word. They weren't exercising the separation that they said they would do. They have this man living in this chamber in the temple. And you'll notice that Nehemiah describes him as an evil man. This command on separation was broken. And it needed to be fixed. It needed to be rectified. And you notice Nehemiah does it. And he doesn't mess up out of it. You'll notice there that as he comes in, he finds this character. In the verse 8, it says, It grieved me sore. Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. He gathers all this man's belongings. He throws him out onto the street. He throws him out with it. He gets rid of it. And he tells the Levites to come in. He says, Cleanse the chamber. This chamber has been polluted. The house of God has been polluted. Cast them out. And you know, you and I, as we think upon this, we're reminded that our body is a temple. Our heart, our lives, are the temple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the New Testament scripture teaches us. And if you and I allow sin into our lives, if we allow the things of this old world to take up residence in our hearts and lives, then effectively we're pushing God out. And maybe for us there needs to be that cleansing today. Maybe for us there needs to be that examination and that throwing out of the things that shouldn't be there. Maybe it's the entertainment. Maybe it's the pleasures, the sport of this world, the music of this world. Maybe those things occupy our heart and they need to be thrown out. But the Lord might have full control. Nehemiah rebukes them for their lack of separation in regard to the fact they have this man in the temple. But we notice the lack of separation in another matter. Because the verse 23 of this chapter tells us, In those days also, I saw Jews that had married wives of Ishtod, of Amnon, and of Moab. If you look back at chapter 10 and the verse 30, you'll find that there the children of Israel had promised to keep themselves unto the Lord. They were not going to intermingle with the heathens that were round about them. Now they have. Nehemiah, as he looks at the people, he recognises that these people are not Jews. In fact, some of them can't even speak the Hebrew language. They were fathers and they'd given their daughters to those that were from nations that did not believe in the God of heaven. There were those that had given their sons, taken for their sons' wives from these nations, again, who did not believe in the law of God. And in doing so, they were compromising their family. They were damaging their home. They were compromising the very nation of Israel. And the Bible reminds you and I as God's people that there is to be separation. There's to be separation for you and I as a Christian. There's to be separation unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we're separate from sin. That's the challenge for the child of God. We're to seek by God's grace and God's help to live a holy life unto him in this world. Now, we are imperfect. There was only one perfect person walked this earth. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. We're imperfect creatures. But we're to seek by God's help to live unto him. We're reminded in 1 Thessalonians 5 and the verse 22 to abstain from all appearance of evil. Sadly, today, the reaction of many Christians, they'll come asking, can I do this? Can I do that? They want to know, can they do all of these things? They want to keep as close to the world as they can. But all the time we should be staying as far away from them as possible. 
And the very fact that we're asking questions about it means we're dubious about it in our own mind. And if you're doubtful about it in your own mind, then the thing is, if you're doubtful, don't. Don't get involved, don't touch it. That way you keep yourself right. We're to be separate from sin. Separate in our individual lives as Christians. We're to be separate in our living. And that brings in what is happening here amongst the Jews. They were not to marry others that did not believe in the God of heaven. And likewise for the man or woman that is saved, that is a child of God, they ought not to marry someone that is unsaved. When we speak of separation here, it's not speaking that you don't marry one of another nation. A Christian ought not to be marrying a non-Christian. Because they have different ambitions, they have different priorities. The Bible reminds us there over in 2 Corinthians 6 in the verse 14. It says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? For the child of God that's saved, you need to seek out a partner in life that's saved. One that loves the Lord the same as you do. One that desires to go to church the same as you do. One that desires to pray the same as you do. One that has a love for the word of God as you do. Because if you don't, then they will draw you away from it. They will hinder your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is to be that separation as an individual. There is to be that separation in our living. There is to be that separation in our worship. And there is a reminder that you and I that are saved, we cannot worship God along with one who worships a different God. We cannot bow down and pray to the God of heaven beside one who believes in Allah. Or believes in Muhammad as prophet. Who does not believe in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That cannot work. There are some today in our world. And they say well we're all praying to the one God. No we're not. The God of the Bible. Is one who is holy. He is one who is full of compassion. He is one who is mercy. Full of mercy. He is one who is just. His son the Lord Jesus Christ. Gave his life on the cross of Calvary. That sinners might be saved. And there are many religions today and they do not accept the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. They do, ex do not accept that there are three persons in the Trinity. Therefore I cannot worship with such a people because they, what they believe is contrary to the word of God. Neither can I bow down in prayer beside one who is praying to Mary. One who is seeking to elevate Mary to the same level as the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mary was with flesh and blood. She was no different from you or I. She was a sinner that needed to be saved. Why should I pray to an earthly person? And yet there are those in our world today. And they worship Mary. They put her on a pedestal. The very same as the Lord Jesus Christ. That is blasphemy. I cannot worship with such a one. Because what they're doing is offensive. In the sight of the God of Israel. It's in sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we think of separation. It affects you and I. In our individual personal lives, it affects us in our relationships, it affects us in our worship. And here we find that Nehemiah again has to deal with this issue. He made these people swear that they would not intermarry with the Gentiles. He made them swear that they would not intermarry with these heathen, heathen nations. And he gives them the example of King Solomon. Of how Solomon brought in all of these wives from other nations and they led them into idolatry and wickedness. Thirdly, we notice here their vows in relation to the Sabbath. Again, back in chapter 10, in the verse 31, they said, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath. That was their vow. Nehemiah comes in, what does he find? You look at the verses that we read together. They're bringing in their crops on the Lord's day. Verse 15, in those days saw I and Judah, some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, bringing in sheaves and leading asses, as also wine, grapes and figs, and all manners of burdens. The Lord's day has just become the same as any other. The farmers are out in the field working. It's no different from the other six. The Bible reminds us in the commandments. Fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. One day is to be kept holy unto the Lord. And that's the challenge for you and I as God's people. That still applies in our land today. That moral law was given to the nation of Israel, but applies to all of mankind. There is that duty to keep one day aside for the worship of God. We need the physical rest. We need the rest in our body. 
But there is to be a day kept aside where we come and worship the God of heaven. And we find that that was not the case here in Jerusalem. They have neglected this law and this command. And we notice that they, and I acted very firmly, he rebuked those Jews that were working and selling on the Sabbath day, and he made them stop. You notice not only did he rebuke those that were actively doing it, but he rebuked the nobles for allowing business to be conducted on the Lord's day. And if you look at it thirdly here, he took a very practical step, and that he commanded the gates to be closed. You look there at verse 19. It says there, whenever it began to be dark, he ordered that the gates of the city be closed. Nehemiah realized the sin that was here, a dishonoring and abusing of the Lord's day. And he says the gates of the city will be closed. No traitors will be getting in and that will stop. That was a practical way of doing it. And you and I as God's people, we need to take practical measures that we're not abusing the Lord's day. There's no need for you and I to be in the shops on Sunday. We know on Saturday what we need. If we're going on a journey on Sunday or Saturday, why not get the fuel on Saturday? And if things aren't that urgent, then they can be left on Monday. There's no need to be out in the shops on the Lord's day. It's not necessary. If there's planning, if there's organization, if we think about it practically, it can be sorted out. It needs to be a day kept aside unto the Lord. Why do the shopkeepers open? It's for great financial gain. That's what was going on here. Financial gain. But the people themselves are breaking their promise before God. And Nehemiah knew if they keep going the same way, God is going to chase them. God is going to judge them. Remember what we said at the start about this book. This comes after the 70 years of captivity that the nation of Israel had endured. Why were they carried captive? Why was it 70 years? Because the land was to be laid in rest every seventh year. It was to be a yearly Sabbath. They didn't observe it. And God said, you will observe it for you'll not be in the land. God takes note of all of these things. God is long-suffering. He's patient. He's merciful. But God will act. We look at our land and we see the abuses of God's law. God deals with it in his time and in his way. And it's the same in the lives of Christians as you and I. If we sin against God, if we grieve God's law, if we continue to do it, then God will chasten in his time and in his way. Here Nehemiah reminds the people of their sin and challenges them to get back into that right relationship with the Lord. How do you and I as God's people, how do we avoid backsliding? Well, number one, we take God's word seriously. We take God's law seriously. We take God seriously and we obey God as commanded in his word. We keep ourselves separate from sin. We don't play around with it. You don't like the child playing about with matches because they'll burn themselves, they'll hurt themselves. And if we're dabbling with sin, we're doing the very same thing. As God's people are to be separate from sin. We're to keep that day aside unto the Lord. We need it for our own physical rest. We need it for communion and fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The old devil would seek to distract God's people. Remember, we're in a battle. There's an enemy. He seeks to distract the saints of God. We shouldn't give him an opening. He'd seek to distract us on a Sunday uh, through busyness, through tiredness, through selfishness. I'm too tired to go to church. I have too many things on. I'm going to be busy tomorrow. I'll just take a wee rest today. Don't allow the old devil to get a foothold in. Keep it on to the Lord and live on to him. In closing in this book, you'll notice that Nehemiah prays there in the very last line. He says, remember me, O oh my God, for good. That little phrase has been used a number of times. Nehemiah is really praying concerning himself here. He, he's saying, Lord, remember me. Give me strength. Give me wisdom. If you look, you'll find it used there in verse 14. He's been dealing with the people regarding their support of the house of God, their giving to the house of God. He says, remember me, O oh my God, concerning this. and Wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God. He said, Lord, remember my neighbours. He's saying in these words, as they're repeated there in verse 22 and verse 31, he's saying, Lord, remember me. I'm imperfect. I falter, I feel. Lord, remember me. Give me wisdom to deal with these things. And as God's people, we need to pray. Pray that the Lord would remember us. That he would strengthen us. That he would encourage us. That he would guide us in the way that we ought to go. Pray for the unconverted. We've been looking at this chapter this morning and we've been addressing it predominantly to God's people. 
Warning against backsliding, but maybe you're listening in and you're not saved. You've never experienced the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never known that cleansing that is found in him alone. I implore you today to repent of your sin. God will deal with those that reject his way of salvation. The Bible tells us there that they will perish in that place that is described as hell. And dear friend, today, how sad it would be if you perished in hell. I encourage you to come. Put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He bled and died that you might be saved. That you might know eternal life. Oh, as we look at this chapter, we see the danger of backsliding. What a warning it is to every child of God. May we take heed to it. For the unconverted, we encourage you to come. Put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And know him alone as Lord and Saviour and Master of your life. We trust and pray that the Lord will bless these thoughts to each of our hearts this morning. We're going to sing a hymn in closing. It's a hymn number 294. Oh, teach me what it meaneth, a cross of lifted high, with one the man of sorrows condemned to bleed and die. Hymn number 294. We're just singing together verse 1 and verse 5. It may loving God as we come before thee this day we do remember the instruction that's in thy word our father as we look at the nation of Israel as we look at men like Abraham and David and Solomon Lord reminded Lord that it's so easy for all of us to fall into sin Lord none of us are immune from it but our God in heaven we pray that even today that there might be that rededication of our lives afresh to thee that there might be that looking in that examining of our hearts and our lives not getting into that proper relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, may we not be so stubborn that we not admit that we have a problem. Lord, may we not be so rebellious against the God of heaven that we'll not do something about it. But Lord, may we sit down and, and look at our lives. Lord, the scripture tells us there in the Second Corinthians 11, let a man examine himself. Lord, may there be that examination today. Lord, as the saints of God, may we look in where there are things that need to be fixed. May we confess our sin. And may we get right before thee. Lord, cleanse us afresh. Help us and enable us to live on to thee as we ought. Our Father, we pray for any listening in this morning that are unconverted. Father, speak to their hearts. Lord, awaken them, we pray, to their need of a Saviour. Bring them to the foot of the old rugged cross. But Lord, may they know that washing and the precious blood of the Lamb. Father, be with thy people. We ask and pray today that they might know that triune blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Resting, remaining, and abiding upon them. For in Jesus' wonderful name, we ask all these things. Amen.